The man known as the godfather of artificial intelligence is now scared of the very technology that he helped pioneer. Jeffrey Hinton has left Google to warn the world about the dangers of AI. Hinton's decades-long research has shaped the AI products and systems that we use today. And in 2018, he was a co-winner of the Turing Prize, a sort of Nobel for computer science. Now he says he regrets his work. And here he is speaking to the BBC. The issue is now that we've discovered it works better than we expected a few years ago, um, what do we do to mitigate the long-term risks of um, things more intelligent than us taking mm. control? And Hinton joins a growing chorus of experts worrying that bad AI could conceivably even lead to the extinction of the human race. Today, Samsung banned its staff from using tools like ChatGBT, citing security concerns. Meanwhile, the IT giant IBM announced that it will pause on hiring for roles that AI could potentially fill, which puts nearly 8,000 jobs at risk in the next five years. So how do we innovate and protect our future by ensuring the so-called moral alignment of this expanding technology. We'll discuss public policy in a moment, but first to an expert, the CEO of the AI company Conjecture, Connor Leahy, joining me now here in London. Welcome, thank you very much indeed. Do you share Jeffrey Hinton's worries? Absolutely. Do you believe, as he thinks, because I'm quoting him, that it is not inconceivable that it could actually lead to the extinction of the human race? Not only is it not inconceivable, I think it is quite likely, unfortunately. And I'm not just the only one saying this. More and more people, such as Hinton, who is really the godfather of this field, as you've already said, the closest we have to an Einstein in the field of AI is now taking these risks extremely seriously and going to the public to actually speak about them. Okay, so this is very dystopian. I mean, you say, you know, not just conceivably, it, it could do. How, in layman's terms, what is the current danger and the nature of this technology that is so dangerous for us. Companies that are working on this te technology, you know, Google, OpenAI, and other ones, explicitly in their goals for what they state they are trying to do is to build godlike intelligence. They're not trying to build just an autocomplete system. This is explicitly their goal, explicitly stated in their founding document. And means what, godlike? This means something that outstrips humans in every form of capability. It is better than humans at every type of reasoning task, every type of physical task, it, at some point, every type of skill-based task, more creative in every way. I believe that if we create a, a system of any kind that is just vastly more intelligent for, than the human race, I don't expect that to end well. So what can be done now. So some of these people, I think Jeffrey Hinton may, may have been one of them, big AI and tech giants, names that we recognize, signed, I think a couple of months ago, a letter, more than a thousand, nearly 2,000 of them, to call for a pause. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. And what were they saying and what happened? So the uh, point of that letter was to call for a moratorium, at least for six months. I personally pushed for longer. Um, on the development of larger, more powerful AI systems that have been built so far. So I think it's quite important to uh, explain quickly yeah. that the difference between an AI system and a software system, a traditional software system is you write code. So you write code, a programmer writes code, which solves a problem. You have some problem, you want it to do something, and you write the code to make it do that. AI is very different. AIs are not really written. They're more like grown you have a sample of data of what you wanted to accomplish. You don't know how to solve the problem. You just have a description or like a samples of the problem. And then you use huge supercomputers to crunch these numbers to kind of like organically almost grow a program that solves these problems. And importantly, we have no idea how these programs work internally. They are complete black boxes. We don't understand at all how their internals work. This is a unsolved scientific problem and we do not know how to control these things. Okay, so this is the bit that I don't understand because human beings are making the stuff, right? The hardware, the, the bits. So how do you not know? This is the bit that I find very difficult to comprehend. Yes. How do you not know and therefore, how are you not able to, you know, to, to control it? 
This is a great question. And so we could take um, examples of uh, synthetic evolution in biology. So in biology, sometimes you would like a bacterium that produces better milk, for example, right? We don't really know how all the genes work in the bacterium, but we could select for good milk bacteria. You know, we can have, we can have, make, try different bacteria and keep the ones who make really good milk. And then we breed those and then we get some more and so on and so on. It's quite similar to this. It's, it's not exactly like this, but basically, instead of us writing a program, we just try a incredible number of programs and we search for the ones who are, that are the best, that are the best programs. But the way these programs are written is not in human language, it's not in code. It's in what's called neural weights, which is, you can kind of imagine like a, just a massive list of numbers, like billions of numbers and like billions of knobs on the box. And you have a big supercomputer that twiddles all the knobs, you know, billions and billions and billions of time, really, really fast. And then eventually it finds some setting of the knobs that works. But what do those knobs mean? It's unclear. Can you, for those who are not critics of this, give an idea of how it can be used to the betterment of, of humanity? Can AI solve world peace? Can it solve the, you know, the war in Russia? Can it solve, you know, between Israel and the Palestinians? Well, at this point, it's definitely not. Um, but I do think it was very important to be clear, like, what makes humanity great to a large degree is our intelligence, you know? The reason we are not chimps is we have intelligence. We develop all this wonderful technology around us. We have language, we have culture, you know, we develop societies and art and all these beautiful things. These are all wonderful things. I love intelligence, you know? I, you know, I love being human. I love all my human friends. But, and AI can help us with this, of course. Um, we're seeing now, you know, a revolution in, you know, tools that allow us to automate simple tasks or complex tasks, allow us to generate new forms of art or media that allow us to, you know, translate text much, much better than any previous method allowed us to. You're really like starting to break down the barriers between languages to a pretty surprising degree often. So, you know, can intelligence at some point solve these problems you describe? And yeah. global hunger. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean, probably. I don't know, obviously, definitely not current systems. But you know, if we have a system which is superior to humans in every conceivable facet, then I expect it to be capable of solving problems that we humans currently can't solve. Currently, what is its main positive? I mean, we hear the word efficiency, which to many means replacing humans, as we just saw, IBM might, with whatever AI is. Yeah, and you know, I wish I had an unalloyed positive story, but there's not an unalloyed positive story. This is always a, I mean, this is a classic risk that always happens when new modern technology and better tools get developed. Some people get replaced. Usually new jobs are created until they're not. You know, at some point we will actually run out of things for humans to do. And I think we're approaching that. You know, when we created the steam engine, it allowed humans to do lots of more cognitive labor. You know, we could think more, we could do more writing and speaking because now the machines could do all the heavy lifting. But if the machines also do all the talking and all the thinking, well, what is left? I don't know. Currently, they're still very useful. Like there's many applications in uh, science and medicine that benefit greatly from uh, artificial intelligence technology to develop better, you know, uh, their therapeutics or understanding proteins to, you know, also generate art or write code. So many, many mm -hmm. developers nowadays, uh, software developers, use uh, products such as uh, GitHub Copilot, which is an AI system which aids them. It doesn't replace them aids them and answers their questions and makes writing the code faster, which is quite convenient. In some of the reading I've done, it appears that what's kind of scary is that the amount of resources put into the capability of this AI far outstrips, and the graph is getting wider, the resources put into the safety aspect of it, what they call the moral alignment to make sure it's not bad and destructive. Can you see that continuing like that? It seems completely unsustainable to me. Billions of dollars and you know, thousands, tens of thousands of our brightest engineers and scientists are working day in, day out to create you know, ever more powerful systems. Well, the number of people who work full time on like the alignment problem is 
probably less than 200 people, if I had to guess. The alignment means making it safe, the moral alignment. Yes, the like controlling of very, very powerful. Agents. So the AI safety field in general, which also includes other concerns, is a bit larger, not very much larger, but it is a bit larger. But the AI alignment field, the question of if we have superhuman intelligence, if we have super intelligence, if we have godlike AI, how do we make that go well? This is a very, very important, and very importantly, this is a scientific problem. This is a scientific problem, an engineering problem that we have to understand and also political problem to a large degree. But the number of people working on this and the amount of funding accessible to them is extraordinarily small. Can you put the genie back into the box? Or how do you regulate? I know you're concerned about regulation. And what does your company do on, on this? This is a great question. So my feeling on regulations here in, in general is, you, you, you ask a good question, can you put the genie back in the bottle? And honestly, the truth is, I don't know. I don't know. I hope you can. I think this is going to be necessary to some degree. I think if we continue at this pace and we just continue to let the bottle, you know, have smoke billowing out of the bottle, this is not going to end well. What I think is the first step I would advocate for is that I think the public deserves to know what is going on. I think this is still a topic that is, people have been talking about these things for years on, you know, like people that are the heads of these labs have publicly stated that they think there are extinction risks from these things. Some of them as far back as 2011. These are, very, these are old discussions that the public is just not informed about. I think that, uh, you know, I think that Parliament and Congress in the US should call upon these labs to testify under oath and actually state what is going on, how risky do you think these things actually are, and what could you do about it. I think this is the first step towards any kind of sensible regulation. And then we also have to talk about how do we put the GE back in the bottle? How do we progress safely? I think there are ways to do this. I mean, there is th this model, and I just want to know also what your company is doing. You know, the CERN model, the biggest particle physics lab in the world, operates not necessarily on a profit motive, but it's intergovernmental to do their, uh, their experiments and research in a sort of an island, not yes. in the public until they've developed the right things. I would absolutely love this. I think this would be fantastic. I would love if governments, especially in intergovernmental bodies, could get to get, come together and uh, control AI and AGI research in particular. I think there's many small applications of AI which do not pose significant risks. But the type of super intelligence research, which is exactly what these large companies currently are doing, like, let me, let me be very frank here. Mm -hmm. There's currently more regulation on selling a sandwich to the public than there is to building potentially godlike intelligence by private companies. There is no regulatory oversight. There, is, there are no audits. There are no reg licensing processes. There is nothing. Anyone can just grab a billion dollars of VC money, big supercomputer, and start doing the cutting edge work on this and release it open onto the internet and no one can stop them. Why did that six month call for the six month pause by the big giants of this, why did it go nowhere? What happened? That's a good question. I would like to ask this question generally to the, uh, to the regulators and the wider people in the world. I think a lot of people are just not informed. So there's a very funny dynamic that happens very often when I talk to other people in this field. People suspect that, oh, we can't stop this, nothing we can do. People don't care. But I think people do care. This is something that affects all of us. This is not something that a few, you know, tech people, you know, like the people that head this company or even me should be able to decide upon. This is something that affects all of us. This is something that affects all governments, all people. And this is not something far away, you know, even you know, mm -hmm. Geoffrey Hinton himself has said that he used to think this is decades away and he no longer thinks this. This is something that will probably affect you and me and definitely our children.